Steve and Lori Spielman live in the town of Baldwinsville, New York. I was looking for a great place to raise our kids. The thing that attracted me to Baldwinsville was it had a great winter. It was a big hockey community. Their nine-year-old son, Chris, lives and breathes ice hockey. Chris started playing ice hockey at four years old. He had a natural gift for it. Chris likes the competition, but he's a fun-loving kid. We always say Chris loves being a kid. One morning in early autumn, the Spielmans take Chris to hockey tryouts. Chris has spent all summer working real hard to pass this travel team tryout. We go out, all the kids are lined up, waiting to take the ice. But when his turn comes, Chris isn't his usual competitive self. He was dropping his stick, and he looked like he was struggling. He was usually one of the fastest skaters, and he was coming in last in some of these drills. His mom, Lori, also spots Chris's unusual behavior. I noticed that a few times he just fell, and it just seemed very unusual for him. But I didn't, I just thought he wasn't trying his hardest. The next day, the team's roster is posted online. We went on the website, and they listed all the team players, and Chris's name was not on it. As a parent, I feel so bad. He just started crying, and he said he tried his best. Chris was extremely upset. Steve and Lori encourage Chris to put the disappointment behind him. But a few days later, when Chris comes home from school, Lori notices something strange. I was doing homework with him, and I noticed that he just would daze off, and the only way to get his attention was to actually get in front of him and call his name. He's having these moments where he dazes out. I have to really, really hold his hand through homework assignments. This is stuff he knows. This is stuff that he could have done in 10 minutes because he'd be so eager to go outside and play. Now I'm helping him figure out what two times five is. He's starting to get frustrated, like he just really doesn't know. A light bulb went off in my mind that maybe something's not right here. By the end of the week, the Spielmans realize that lack of concentration is the least of Chris's problems. It's Friday night, it's pizza night. We're sitting here having dinner as a family. Everything seems normal. Chris kind of gets up from the table and says, I'm not hungry, which is odd because he's usually good for three slices of pizza. He goes and onto the couch in front of the TV. Next thing I know, he's sleeping. I looked at my wife and I said, he must be sick. We take his temperature, it was 103. He always tended to get high fevers. He's always had ear infections. We're hoping it would just go away. But on Wednesday night, just before bedtime, there is an alarming development. Chris is laying on the couch, and it's getting late. My husband picks Chris up, and Chris just started freaking out. He's yelling hysterically for me to put him down. He does not want to be touched. He just keeps yelling at me, Dad, don't touch me, don't touch me, put me down. He's got a hockey player mentality. Nothing hurts him. I've never been so scared in my life. It is clear something is wrong. Startled, Steve races Chris to the emergency room. When we're in the emergency room, the doctors are looking at Chris and they go through all the standard testing, blood tests and, and everything else. I could see the look on the doctor's face now and obviously I know something's wrong. The test on Chris's spinal fluid has come back abnormal, indicating that there could be something wrong with Chris's brain. Chris is put in the care of pediatric neurologist, Dr. Kevin Ragosta. His behavior was such that I thought that it could be a virus infection. If you don't treat them early and aggressively, they can destroy your brain. Dr. Ragosta prescribes an antiviral medication. But the mysterious illness only gets worse. As the night goes by and I'm by his side, he starts shaking. 
His body starts tremoring, and his eyes are starting to roll in opposite circles from each other, and they actually start kind of going up in his head. And he told me he couldn't see me and that he was scared, and that's when I got scared. Dr. Ragosta rushes him to the ICU. He started having seizures, and his level of consciousness became clearly compromised. MRIs reveal that Chris is suffering from encephalitis, a dangerous swelling of the brain, often caused by an infection. His brain was clearly inflamed. When the body is attacked by a foreign invader, it sends immune cells to the infected area, causing inflammation. Normally, this helps the body heal, but inflammation in the brain can be fatal. As the brain tissue swells, it presses against the skull, killing the brain's own cells. If enough cells die, the brain stops functioning, and the victim dies. He was regressing instead of progressing. And then you reach a point and said, OK, he doesn't have something that we can actively treat with antibiotics or antiviruses. Chris is getting worse by the hour. His awareness of the environment just started to become less and less and less. And a boy that was just talking to you a day or two earlier now doesn't even seem to know your existence. And they said the next thing that was going to happen was he wasn't going to be able to breathe on his own. And they said that to protect his airways, they were going to need to induce him in a coma and intubate him. At this point, I don't know what to think. It's the scariest thing I've ever went through. My husband and I just are still hoping everything's just going to turn out OK. The doctors connect Chris to a ventilator, and within minutes, he slips into a coma. I was shocked and scared, and I asked the doctor, what are the chances of him coming out of this? I was given a you know, variety of, it, it could be a day, it could be weeks, or it could be years, or it could be never. With Chris's life in the balance, Dr. Ragosta considers one final treatment, steroids. Steroids is one of those two edged swords. Steroids can reduce the inflammation by inhibiting the body's immune response. But in doing so, they might give whatever is attacking Chris free reign and make the infection even worse. The doctors are very clear that this was experimental and that there wasn't enough in the scientific literature to prove that this would work or not work. And we decided to go for it. After being treated with steroids, he has made a partial recovery. But his parents are terrified that the parasite might still be lurking somewhere in his brain. Now we're looking at Chris, and we don't know what the future was going to hold for him. My wife and I both feared that Chris's recovery maybe wasn't a recovery at all. There's not a lot of information out there about how survivors do. Is he going to continue to get better? What's he going to look like a week, a month from now? The real way that one knows what's going to happen is to wait. While the doctors wait to see if the acanthamoeba returns, they begin to look at how Chris might have contracted such a ruthless parasite. I do know that weeks before Chris's illness, we were at a party where there was a pond, and Chris and all his friends were playing by the pond, and Chris found a hockey puck that he scooped up out of the water. Acanthamoeba are very common in the environment. They're found in all kinds of places like swimming pools, ponds, inside air conditioning units. People are exposed to acanthamoeba all the time. Normally, that's not a problem because the immune system can stop acanthamoeba before it takes hold in the body. But in Chris's case, the parasite somehow sidestepped his immune system and attacked his brain. Doctors continue to monitor Chris, still fearing that the killer amoeba might still be alive in his system. But after six weeks of rehab, Chris regains his speech, muscle control, and neurological function.